very well uh, a priest uh, from the Philippines, uh, Louis Jean Donny, who became a member of the political party linked with the New People's Army. And he was expelled from uh, the Philippines and he was living in the Netherlands. <clears throat> And uh, there he, he became, or he was sent, I don't know exactly uh, the way, uh, as the voice of the political party and uh, the New People's Army uh, in, the, yeah, in the, the foreign sphere, you know. <clears throat> so he was... Uh, a kind of uh, <coughs> representative uh, outside of the Philippines. And I don't remember how we developed some the contacts and we see each other several times. And one day he asked me if uh, he could use the city as a meeting place with people of the government. Because they, he did not want to do it in in Holland because he was staying there and he had, had to be a little prudent. And Setri was a good place because it was in Louvain la Neuve, uh, international atmosphere. So if you had people coming from outside, from Asia, etc., there was no no problem. And two senators came from the Philippines in order to have uh, talks with the representative of the guerrilla movement. And they had uh, three days, I think, more or less three days uh, talks over there. And they tried to come to some agreement to begin a peace process. And of course, the whole thing failed, finally, <clears throat> did not succeed, except on one point, and that was the no renewal of the American military bases in the Philippines. That was an agreement between the government and the guerrilla. And it is the only point which has been applied. <laughs> the rest was not, uh, did not succeed. But that, yes. <laughs> so the government, the government refused to renew the contract with the United States of America for the military bases in the Philippines. And the uh, Americans have been obliged to go, go away. I suppose that at that time, from the strategic point of view, it was not a big problem for them. Otherwise, they would not have accepted that anyway. So I don't know where, where they deployed their their uh, <coughs> operations, if it was in Okinawa or some other places. But anyway, that was the only point which uh, uh, was uh, coming to an agreement. Later on, of course, I had contacts with, uh, with both sides. Um, the movement, the political party, asked me to go to Geneva precisely for the the Commission Committee of uh, Human Rights. So I had meetings there uh, with people of the representative of the guerrilla movement also. And a few, a few years later, well, I, I was expelled uh, from the Philippines by the Marcos government. They expelled me from the Philippines. Uh, because uh, we had organized uh, se training seminars in the Philippines with the social movements and the churches uh, on practically on Marxist analysis. You know? uh, it was not called like that, of course, because otherwise it would have been too easy to... But it was called uh, structural analysis. And we had seminars uh, which had been tape recorded and, and, and used in the whole country for the different movements of how to analyze society in terms of classes, etc. 
So of course they, 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 they discovered that. And uh, a year later when I was coming back from Hong Kong to, no, I was not coming from Hong Kong. I was coming from, the, from South Korea. But my colleague Geneviève Le Mercinier uh, was my colleague at the university, a sociologist also, uh, was with me in Hong Kong. We had a seminar for the same kind of training with the young Christian workers here in Hong Kong. But I was invited in South Korea by the Buddhist University for some, some uh, international meeting. So she, she went directly to the Philippines and I went to South Korea. And from South Korea, I came to the Philippines. And when I arrived that, I was not allowed to enter the country. Hmm? And then uh, I was expelled. And as a matter of fact, the reason that they were giving is the fact that uh, uh, I was uh, too dangerous because of, uh, well, they accused me of all kinds of things. <clears throat> like to be, have been a member of the guerrilla in, in, in Colombia. They just uh, made a, a confusion with Camilo Torres. <laughs> so stupid things and that I was critical of the Pope, that, that my writings were the Bible of the leftist Christians, and all kinds of things like that. Well, anyway, they expelled me. So, <clears throat> 10 years later, and uh, the situation had changed. Marcos was no more in power. And I was invited again in the Philippines with my colleague Geneviève for a new series of seminars. And uh, so that was just coinciding with uh, one month of ceasefire between the guerrilla and, and, and the government and negotiations. So it happened that uh, the different places where we were giving the seminars were generally uh, seminaries or uh, religious houses, you see. And those were the places where the guerrilla was staying because it was the only place where they felt more or less secure. They, 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 they were not, of course, they did not trust and the government, government forces. So they, <clears throat> in the on the national level, but also on regional levels, there were negotiations and they were staying in religious homes. Hmm? So we were together <laughs> by chance. And once in the island of uh, what is the name of Dabu, uh, uh, one of the main islands, where we had a seminar during uh, several days. We were there with the national uh, leaders of the guerrilla movement. So, the same house. Mm -hmm. So we had long, long conversations and discussions. And one night, that is uh, just a parenthesis, but of course there was a curfew all over, especially in that island, which was very militarized. And uh, when there has been an incident, in spite of the curfew, the army killed two young guerrilla uh, members, two brothers. And uh, the day after, or two days after, there was the funeral of those two young people. And the funeral happened, uh, a religious funeral, in the church. And so I proposed to the people of the seminar that we, that we had to go and participate to the funerals. So everyone accepted. And we went there. I remember the city was completely empty because it was curfew. But we went to the church. The church was full, full, full. And um, the seminarians of the Redemptorist, which is a, a Catholic religious uh, order, 
uh, were singing the mass, and they had a special mass in the in the way of theology of liberation, you know. And it was very impressive because the church was full, and guerrilla members had come from the mountains. Hmm? Uh, very poor people, sometimes without shoes, you know, just peasants uh, fighting in, in the mountains. They had come for for the funeral because it was a there was a ceasefire. Hmm? So it was extremely impressive. And I remember during the Mass, I concelebrated the Mass with some of the Filipino priests. And uh, the second reading uh, of the Mass was done by a, a commander of the guerrilla, a young man. One month later, he was, he was killed. And at the moment of the offertory uh, of the Mass, when you bring the bread and wine to be, uh, to be blessed, the father of the two boys was there, and he brought the flak of the guerrilla to put on the altar. So it was really very impressive. And sometimes helicopters were coming uh, above the, the, the church, and because so many people were outside of the church, they could not enter all. So when the helicopters were coming, everyone was rushing in inside the church. You know, because they didn't know what uh, what could happen. So it was a very impressive thing. And then when the service was over. They put the bodies of the two young men on a truck of the church. And it was a, a, truck of, a cooperative of the church, which was a cooperative of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. So they had the inscription, a cooperative of Our Lady of, Culture of uh, Perpetual Help. But it was full of red flags, of course. <laughs> so they went, you see, but in complete silence, total silence. There was a lot of thousands of people, but totally in silence. And with the, the people uh, after the, the, the behind the truck, having the two bodies uh, walking. And with some some banners, the banners were generally we want land reform, hmm? and in full silence, but also with extremely poor people, those poor people coming from the mountains, you know, from the guerrilla. Oh, it was extremely extremely impressive. Okay, so when uh, we finished that seminar in there. I went to Manila, and there I uh, had uh, meetings with uh, senators, some of them I had known before. And uh, so I could discuss with the senators all what had been said by the guerrilla leaders to know what kind of agreement could uh, perhaps uh, have been achieved. But as a matter of fact, after one month, the negotiation fell down, and and the and and the war went on. You know, so there was one month of and uh, my friend Louis Jalandoni had come back to the Philippines during this month because of a month of ceasefire. So he had come back uh, precisely to help, of course, in in the negotiations. But he had to go back uh, to Holland after that. And uh, later on, uh, about two years ago, as a matter of fact, I had been invited now to the Philippines, but I, I, I could not go uh, to open an international seminar on human, human rights. But uh, I sent a, by Skype uh, or by video uh, a speech to for the opening of their seminar. 
But two years ago, I went there, and I remember I again there were some negotiations between the government and the guerrilla. And one night, I remember I had a supper with a member of the government, who was an old friend. And he was of the progressive movements at that time, but he had joined the government, and he was in charge of uh, social ministry, Ministry of Social Affairs. And the following day, I had lunch with the number three of the guerrilla. <laughs> because he, that was also a moment of negotiation, you know. So just, uh, well, that was just to get some information, what, what was the possibility of, of going further. But uh, that did not succeed either at that time. So if the new president of today makes a, a new a new proposal for a negotiation, I think uh, this is uh, a very important matter. Now, in between, of course, I had uh, contacts with the uh, FARC in La Habana, with the Colombian uh, guerrilla movement. Um, since a long time, I had some contacts with them occasionally when they were uh, assisting to some international events. and But each time, no, I was going to La Habana since the time of the negotiation in La Habana, each time I had a contact with them. And uh, a, year, a, year, a year ago, yes, uh, they asked me to give a talk to the whole delegation of what was the situation of Ecuador, because they did, they did understand very well what they had some information in, in a way or another, they wanted to have an analysis of what was what was the situation in Ecuador. So tomorrow, tomorrow when I go to Cuba, I will have a new contact with the FARC, also with the delegation of the guerrilla in the negotiation, and I could um, I could bring to them already a year or a year and a half ago the whole documentation on the negotiation in the Philippines. Because that was interesting to see what kind of process, how, how, how in the Philippines they failed, it's true. But anyway, there, was, there has been a whole process of negotiation. What did they negotiate? What did they accept? What did they not accept, etc. So I was able to give uh, to the, the, the delegation of the of the FARC in, 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 in La Habana, uh, the documentation about what has happened in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So we hope that now negotiations have been practically uh, suc have succeeded in, 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 uh, in uh, Colombia. Uh, we hope that they may succeed also now in the Philippines. Because uh, since a long time, I was also thinking that there was no future for a guerrilla movement for the moment, for many reasons, you know, neither in Latin America, neither in, in the Philippines. And that it was necessary to come to an end of the armed, um, of the, of the armed struggle. Hmm? Of course, this does not mean the end of a social struggle, <laughs> because of course the bourgeoisie, especially in a country like uh, like uh, Colombia, where perhaps even the bourgeoisie is is is, is more more hard than in the Philippines, uh, that they will use the peace process as a way of continuing their hegemony, their social hegemony. So we don't have to to have illusions. That is not the end of the social struggle, but at least it is the end of the armed social struggle, and that is, I think, a, a very important step. Since we are talking about Colombia, could you tell me more about uh, how you how you related to Camilo Torres? <clears throat> yes. Uh, 
It's a long story because my first visit in Colombia was in '54, uh, when uh, I went after my studies in Chicago University. I went to for six months in Latin America to visit the young Christian workers because I was associated with the movement in Belgium and in Europe, and. I was very interested, of course, in the movement also in other parts of the world, and in particular in Latin America, because I had had some contacts with some of the leaders when they were coming to Europe, or some of the priests uh, uh, being associated with the, with the movement. And so I had been very interested always in, in Latin America since, uh, since my studies in, in Louvain which uh, where there were quite a few contacts with Latin America since a long time. So I went uh, to Central America and then to Colombia. And in Colombia, the head or the director of the seminary was a Canadian priest. And I had known him in Montreal because between my studies in Chicago in my travel in Latin America, I had spent three months in Montreal, uh, invited by the university to give some lectures on sociology of religion and urban sociology. And so I had known him, and so he invited me to come to give a talk to the seminarians on sociology, sociology of religion, what I did. And after that, uh, seminarian, one of the seminarians came to see me and he said, well, could you come another day again to the seminary because we have a small group of seminarians interested in social questions and we like to have a discussion with you to go further. So I said, okay, yeah, great pleasure. And this was, he was Camilo Torres. So I came back and I had this meeting with this group that Camilo had organized. And when I saw the interest of Camilo Torres, and he was a very clever man, and the way that he was approaching the social problems of, of Colombia, I told him, why don't you come to Louvain? to make social studies, so you could have a little more background to continue the work. So, of course, he was very interested in that, and uh, he got the permission from his bishop, the Archbishop of, of Bogota, and a few months later, he came to Louvain. And there, uh, he was... Uh, adopted by my family <laughs> because um, during the time of exams, for example, um, he came, he was coming to my house hmm, to the, with my brothers and sisters and, and so to be quiet to study there. And, and his mother came during one, well, almost a year in Louvain. And she met uh, my mother also, so they became friends, and, and so the relation was a, a very personal relation. Uh, during the time that Camilo was there, I was appointed, uh, I had my first appointment to teach at uh, Louvain University, so he followed one of my first course of sociology of religion there. And I remember also that we had been appointed together uh, secretary of uh, <clears throat> a very strange thing, um, of the Vatican Pavilion for the World, uh, the world Fair of uh, 1968 in uh, 1968 or 58, 58 
in Brussels, they have, you know, there is this, uh, this organization every four or five years of a, a world uh, fair in each country is building a pavilion uh, a place to show uh, what what is uh, what is the life of, of the pavilion of, of the country, and the Vatican had, of course, uh, one <coughs> one um, exhibition place, and uh, I was at that time secretary of the of the archbishop of the archbishop uh, of Belgium, and in function of that. I was appointed as a secretary for the organization of the Vatican uh, Pavilion. And the Bishops' Conference of Latin America appointed Camillo to represent the Latin American Church. But the director of the commission uh, was a businessman, a Catholic, uh, Belgian Catholic businessman, extremely conservative. And the whole idea of the Vatican at that time, it was with the time of Pius XII, was very triumphalist, you know, to show the importance of the church in the world, the wealth of the Vatican, etc., etc. So we were, we were completely, completely against that kind of conception. So after six months, we, we renounced. <laughs> we, we were not able to continue that kind of responsibility. Well, that is a, a small part of the history. So, a few years later, between um, 58 and 62, uh, I happened to, to coordinate a research work, socio-religious research work, on Latin America. What, what is, what was the the social and religious situation of Latin America. And I worked uh, for that with uh, a priest I had known in North America, in the States, and who was the representative of the Holy See to the FAO, of the Vatican to the FAO. He was a man who founded uh, a rural movement in North America, and he had also a very good international view and, uh, and he was very interested in Latin America. He became interested in the research work I made on Chicago, so he proposed me to make the same kind of research work, socio-religious research work in Latin America. Uh, he tried to interest uh, the Vatican to that, but there was absolutely no interest. So he decided that he would go along himself, and he found the money to try to finance a, a research on the situation of Latin America. And uh, <coughs> so I worked during four years for the coordination of this research work. Uh, with uh, teams uh, in each country. It was a huge work, especially at that time the communication was not so easy as today. And uh, finally we published uh, 43 volumes <laughs> of the whole research because it was not only on religious issue but also the demographic issue, the rural uh, structure, the the workers' movement, uh, the Protestant uh, churches, uh, so uh, socio-religious survey of Latin America. And in the year 60, I spent uh, four or five months in Bogota. Because Bogota was the place where the Latin American Bishops' Conference coordination was located and I worked with them because it was a group at that time of very progressive bishops within, within a framework of very conservative bishops in Latin America. But the representative of the different countries on the Latin American sphere 
happen to be very, very progressive people. Just because I think the, the bishops' conference were voting and they voted for people who had already international contacts. And those were the bishops who had studied in Europe and generally and had contacts with the more, the more progressive wings of the church. And so it happened to be a, a very interesting group of bishops. So I was working with them because they were very interested in that research. Hmm? And, and so we were working together very, very, very well. And of course, because I was in Bogota, I, I had the contact with Camilo. Hmm? And Camilo at that time was organizing the School of Sociology at the National University. He had been appointed uh, as uh, chaplain uh, of the university, of the students at the university, but also was giving one or two courses in sociology and was working with uh, Orlando Falsborda, a great sociologist, a great Latin American sociologist, to found the Institute of Sociology at the National University of Bogota. And I worked with them also <coughs> for the organization of the of sociology in, 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 in this university and uh, to promote some of the publications, etc. At the same time that I was coordinating the and trying to, be, to begin to write the synthesis of all those researchers. And I had asked Camilo to write one of the books, one of the books of the collection, uh, on a very specific issue, uh, which were the radiophonic schools in Colombia. And this was an interesting initiative, relatively conservative but interesting because it had some result that they did not expect uh, to, to, uh, to have a kind of campaign of literacy for the peasants through radio. Hmm? And as a matter of fact, it had very much the peasant to, be, to become more socially aware. <laughs> what, what they did not expect, of course. <laughs> but. Uh, Anyway, it was an interesting experiment, so I asked uh, Camilo to make the research on that, uh, on that initiative, and that became one of the books of the collection. So we worked together during that time quite a bit, and later on, during several years, I was coming back regularly to Latin America, uh, we went together to different places of Latin America, to Europe also. And of course, he was evolving in his thinking because of his experience. When he came back from Louvain, he had a relatively good training uh, in a philosophical approach of society. And of course, uh, in the traditional approach of the social doctrine of the church, but on a radical way, uh, which uh, is uh, finally approaching society with a certain reading of society, not in terms of social classes, but in terms of social straight a stratification. And so the whole idea of the social doctrine of the church is that to build up justice, hmm, a just society, you have to bring together the different stratification of society to build together social justice. From the workers, the peasants, the bourgeoisie, uh, all, all together hmm, because of religious conviction. And that makes that the analysis of society is in terms not of social classes, but of social stratification. And that was the base of uh, our training in the mind too at that time. It allowed to go 
to go relatively far in the condemnation of capitalism, because capitalism is destroying precisely this possibility of creating a common good. Hmm? But it was also a way of rejecting the Marxist analysis hmm? and the class analysis. Hmm? But when Camilo came back to Colombia, he began, of course, to work along that line hmm, of the social doctrine of the church. And he was bringing the students from the rich neighborhoods to work in the poor neighborhoods. He was working with uh, some rural movement, Catholic movement. He had been also appointed by the Bishop's Conference in the National Commission for Land Reform. And little by little, he was discovering that all those things did not change the reality. <laughs> it was okay for uh, new consciousness, uh, more social consciousness. He discovered that the, commission, the National Commission for Land Reform was just a joke, <laughs> a way for the ruling classes not to perform a land reform. So little by little he discovered that also the tool of analysis was not adequate. And also in Louvain we had, uh, at that time, we had a, a good introduction to Marxism. Uh, critical, but uh, not, uh, not uh, a caricature of Marxism. It was a good analysis of, of Marxism. So he had also a certain background in what was a Marxist analysis. And of course he went on on that line and uh, he became, he, 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 yes, he, he began to apply more and more uh, Marxist analysis of society, uh, analysis in terms of classes, etc. He had already begun in Louvain with uh, his thesis, his, th his uh, thesis of uh, mastership, of, at that time it was a license. Uh, was on the social classes in uh, Bogota. Hmm? So he had made already some work going more or less along that line that he developed much more after. And then finally he, he came to the conclusion that in the society of uh, Colombia the only way was to try to bring together all the leftist forces in order to try to achieve a certain political power. Because uh, there had been, of course, some, uh, uh, some uh, try, like uh, Eliezer Gaitan, who was assassinated in 1948, uh, what was, has been called the Bogotasso. Hmm? He was assassinated. He was a liberal, but a, a social liberal, uh, really believing in popular, popular uh, strength and, and movements. And therefore, of course, he was assassinated. And the result has been, after that, a massacre of all the leadership even the local leadership of his movement. And so Camilo was <coughs> retaking a little bit that current, which was crushed in the year 48. At that time, Fidel was in Bogota, at that time of the Bogota, so he had some parts there. And, uh, and so in the years 60s, uh, the beginning of the 60s, Camilo came to that conclusion that he should uh, try to promote a new political movement with a coalition of all the leftist forces, from the left Christian democracy to the Communist Party, and he succeeded with the creation of the popular unit, hmm? La Union Popular. And his movement had a tremendous uh, success all over Colombia. 
Of course, then he was rejected by the church. He was obliged to leave the priesthood, hmm? uh, which he did with great pain because he was believing in it. And his position was to say, well, if I take that kind of political, uh, political position, it is because of my Christian faith. <laughs> Because I believe that, 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 that Jesus Christ uh, uh, has brought us also a message of justice, uh, of uh, equality, of peace, of love, etc. And that uh, within the social structure of uh, Colombia, which is, which is one of the most unequal hmm, in all Latin America, uh, if Christians are not involved in transforming the structure of society, they are not faithful to their own faith. Hmm? And so uh, he succeeded, like I said, but immediately, of course, the bourgeoisie in, uh, in Colombia, the liberal and the conservative, there's uh, always the two, the two blocks uh, fighting against each, so each other, but uh, when there is one common enemy, of course, they come together. <laughs> so the enemy was Camilo. And then they use all kinds of means to stop him. For example, they, f they were able to uh, avoid that any kind of airline company would give a ticket to Camilo. So he could not travel anymore in the country. Uh, he had to hire some small planes and things like that, you know. So all kinds of uh, obstacles were put. And I remember when I went several times uh, to Colombia, I discussed with him. And uh, at one time I had the impression that because of this resistance of the bourgeoisie, there was little chance that his movement, who had a great popular success, could, could really have a political success. Hmm? Because the bourgeoisie was ready to use any kind of means against him. And so I remember that he told me, probably the last time I saw him, that he could not stay two nights in the same place because his head was put at a price, you know? so he could be assassinated. So one or two times when I saw that the situation was coming to a dead end, I proposed him to come back to Louvain for, to make a PhD and take some distance from the local situation and then try to come back later on. But he always told me no, no, because that would be a betrayal of the people who have put their confidence in me. So I cannot, because the struggle is very difficult, I cannot just leave the country and, and leave all the people there. I could, I could understand that, but, um, but still I continued. So in 65, 65 I, in October, I think, if I remember well, um, I had a meeting in, uh, in New York. And instead of coming back uh, directly from New York to Louvain, I decided to go through Bogota because I got a scholarship for him to make his PhD in Bogota, uh, in Louvain. But when I came in Bogota, it was too late. Five days before, he had left for the mountain. And a few months later, the 15th of February, uh, 1966, yes, he was killed in the mountain. Hmm? So that is the story. <laughs> that is the story.
Did you hear about uh, the circumstances of his death? Was oh, of the what? The circumstances of his death. Was he betrayed or...? No, 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 no. Circumstances yes, was very clear, no. Uh, he joined, he did not join the FARC. He joined uh, the other movement, E N L, the National Liberation Army, which was more of a Gevarist, Che Guevara uh, ID, more than the FARC, which were linked with the Communist Party of Colombia, more traditional. And uh, when he went there, because it was also a priest who found that movement, the Spanish priest, so he knew him before. So he took the contact and then he was accepted in the movement, but he was accepted as an ordinary member of the guerrilla. And so uh, at that time when he joined, he made some statements, very interesting ones. Uh, one statement for uh, appeal to the youth, to the army, uh, to the to the Christians, etc., uh, asking to join, of course, the the movements in order to transform society. And that time, it was possible to think along that line because of the Cuban Revolution. A few later, a few years later, the Sandinista Revolution. So it was not uh, an impossible thing to, to, to transform society through armed struggle, you know. So then uh, he was, uh, he was uh, brought in a, a combat a struggle, a local struggle, like, like other members. And the uh, idea was that uh, when they, if some of the soldiers of the of the army were killed, uh, you had to recuperate the arms because at that time they were. So some soldier was, I think, wounded. And then he went uh, to try to get it, the arm of the soldier and he was killed by, by the army. So it was a, a guerrilla operation. It was no, nothing special. Yeah. I heard that afterwards many priests and nuns and young people joined the movement. Yes, uh, I would not say many, but at least some, yes. I remember that in 68 when I was again in, uh, in Colombia, I had a meeting in, in, in Medellin with some priests uh, to discuss if they should join or not. The, the guerrilla. Hmm? So that was really a, a, a very existential pro, uh, problem for quite a few of them, the ones who were the most socially committed, you see. And so, uh, see, of course, uh, some, some of them uh, joined, of course, the guerrilla movement. And, uh, and in this sense, uh, that was surely the beginning of a a new, a, a new phenomenon which developed at, uh, later on in Latin America of uh, the participation of Christian groups uh, to the guerrilla movement, like in Nicaragua, like in Salvador, like in Guatemala, etc. And uh, it began it began really in uh, in Colombia. Yeah. And you said that. Uh Actually, in 1958, you met Fidel in Bogota. Uh, yeah, I, I met uh, so in 54. Yeah, I met uh, Camilo. Camilo in 54. Yeah, yeah. And Fidel? Ah, Fidel, no, 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 no. Fidel was uh, in Bogota in 48. 48, the Bogotazo. He happened to be there because of a student movement meeting. And during that meeting, the assassination of Gaetan happened also. So Fidel happened to be in Bogota in 48 during the Bogotazo, 
and we don't know how much, but uh, of course the, the, the foreign students who were there in meeting uh, were in sympathy with the movement of Gaetan and also reacted against uh, the repression of the government. But then later you developed uh, more links with Fidel? Ah, yes, no, of course I did not know Fidel. Uh, at that time, first I was not in Bogota in 48, uh, because it was in 54 that I came there. Uh, later on, yes, I developed uh, links with Cuba. Um, I, my, my first visit in Cuba was in 53, so it was before the revolution. And then I came back in, uh, I think it was in 61 or something like that. Um, <clears throat> when uh, when I, I, I had um, meetings, of course, with more, more uh, my co first contacts in Cuba were with the uh, progressive Christians and also with the uh, young Christian workers. You know? And uh, so I I went back about a year and a half or two years after the revolution, also and for some contacts and but uh, it is only later on that I began to have more contacts with the uh, with the Marxist intellectuals of Cuba who were very interested in what was happening in uh, Nicaragua in Central America at that time and then uh, they put me in contact with the Central Committee of the Communist Party. They invited me for in 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 ninety in eighty six. Invite me to give a course of sociology of religion to the some of the main responsible of the ideology of the party for two weeks hmm, uh, to know to try to have a, an analysis of what was happening in Central America and why Christians were committed in revolutionary movements. And also they had contacts with the liberation theology. It was the same year that uh, Fray Beto made its famous interview with Fidel about Fidel and religion, huh? etc. So then I developed, of course, uh, some more contacts and then I have been invited uh, several times for uh, international meetings for seminars, etc. And also then I began to meet Fidel uh, quite a few times uh, and have discussion on different issues uh, till the time that I was invited for his 80th anniversary and I came there one or two days before when he became ill. And at that time the Cubans asked me to work with them to try to to organize a solidarity international solidarity with cuba of intellectuals with cuba at the occasion of the illness of of fidel so to avoid an international intervention hmm, in cuba at that time and to have to try to have uh, uh, the greatest possible number of intellectuals and Nobel Prize in the world backing the position of Cuba, saying it is not acceptable that, that, that the illness of Fidel uh, could become an occasion to intervene in Cuba. And uh, so uh, during a few days there I worked uh, especially with the Ministry of Culture on that issue and uh, they asked me to preside the international press conference on the issue in uh, in La Habana and that was a very interesting experience yeah. <laughs> a very interesting experience because of course when when I came to to the press room the press room was full 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 of uh, foreign correspondent there were four uh, big American channels, television, CBS, and etc., everything. And of course, 
they were there not to hear what I would have to say about the campaign uh, among intellectuals to try to block the, any kind of uh, intervention. But they were all expecting news of the health of Fidel. <laughs> what, of course, <laughs> I, I could not say one word about that. <laughs> so I think they were deceived, deceived <laughs> by the press conference because there was no news about the health of Fidel. <laughs> but well, news about what uh, the, the kind of support that we could get in a few days from Nobel Prizes and, and intellectuals in, in the world, yeah. yeah. That was an interesting thing. But so, yes, I, I had the occasion of, uh, and later on, after that also, I uh, spent twice uh, some time with Fidel and, and a few other intellectuals when he recuperated uh, in, uh, in discussion, even long discussions, uh, a whole day discussion hmm, on uh, various issues of Cuba and, and of the world. Yeah. But um, for more specific issue, we had uh, discussion uh, on global globalization, on, uh, on terrorism. I remember one meeting that I was invited uh, on, on terrorism. Uh, what what is terrorism? It was already at least 15 years ago. So, on the, also on the social forums, and we had strong discussion with Fidel on that <laughs> because he had uh, he had uh, some ideas that. that that I did not agree with. <laughs> and, and it was interesting because, of course, in Cuba, in Cuba it's difficult to, to, to disagree with Fidel, no? <laughs> it's practically almost impossible for. But, uh, but Fidel likes that, you know? He likes to have a, a, a possible uh, discussion. So, I remember that was a, a seminar on Marxist uh, on Marxist thinking and uh, the importance f for today of a Marxist thinking. And so I choose to speak about a Marxist analysis of the World Social Forum. And uh, it was a panel. There were four people and Fidel was there and of course quite a few other people and uh, I was the last one to speak and each one had 15 minutes no but the four the three people who spoke before me took much more time than the 15 minutes I remember there was a Chinese he spoke 20 minutes about Fidel <laughs> before entering its topic and then there were two other Latin Americans who, who spoke, of course, uh, 25 minutes. And so when, when I had to speak, I said, uh, well, um, very sorry, but uh, all my companions, you know, ate my minutes. <laughs> so I will try to follow the example of, of the commandant, of Fidel. I will try to be brief. <laughs> so, of course, they all laughed, and Fidel in particular was laughing. And so I began to make the analysis of the social forum. And then when I finished that, Fidel asked the word. And he said, it was at a time that the social forum decided to go to India, Bombay. Hmm? So Fidel said, why? did you decide in the International Committee to go out of Latin America for the World Social Forum? Just at a time that imperialism is extremely aggressive against Latin America, and at a time that there is uh, the move toward some new political movements in Latin America, 
And that is just that time that you choose to go out of Latin America. Why? Hmm? So I said, well, Commandant, uh, uh, this is very simple. The World Social Forum is a world forum, and it cannot remain only in Latin America. So it has to go different parts of the world. So Fidel again say, said, no, no, no. No, no, no. This is the result of a decision of Europeans with a few Brazilians. So I said, well, Commandante, uh, I don't believe in the complot <laughs> theory. There was no complot, complot, uh, you say complot, I don't know, or you say that there was no, you know, not a, uh, a small group uh, trying to, uh, to manipulate the matter, it was really because of, uh, of the world character of the World Social Forum. And I said, if you say that the World Social Forum should always happen in Latin America, that is a Latin American centrist position. Oof, there was a big noise in the whole people shooting, uh, say, <laughs> and saying, well, what, 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 uh, uh, you have attacked the position of Fidel, whatever. And then uh, the Minister of Culture, who is a good friend, uh, Abel Prieto, uh, stood up and he said, Francois, you cannot accuse Cuba of being Latin American centrist. We have helped Vietnam, we have helped uh, Angola, we are sending thousands of doctors all over the world. <laughs> so I said, but that is not the question. <laughs> Of course, Cuba has an international vision. But if you pretend that the World Social Forum should stay in Latin America, that is a Latin American centrist position. And the people again were <laughs> shooting all over. Ah, it was terrible. So at one, once then Fidel asked the, the world again, and he said to me, are there social movement in India? Oh. So, <laughs> so I said, well, Commandante, <laughs> there are social movements in India who have ten times as many members of all the social movements in Latin America. <laughs> so so the, the, the struggle was going on. <coughs> so, the discussion was going on and people are asking the world to defend my position, some others were defending the position of Fidel. Anyway, uh, Fidel was very happy <laughs> about this discussion. And it went on and on and on till four o'clock in the afternoon and no lunch. So <laughs> at one moment Fidel looks at the watch and he says, uh, well, we have physical necessities, we must have a lunch, you know, so let us stop. And we all went to lunch. And one hour after, we came back at five o'clock. And it went on, the discussion. The whole program of the afternoon was just uh, <laughs> forgotten. <laughs> they still continue to discuss. <coughs> and I was in a difficult situation because I had to catch a plane to go back to Europe the same, the same night, uh, six or seven o'clock, I don't remember. But I could not leave when, when Fidel was there. See, oh, it was an impossible situation. Well, anyway, finally it finished, of course. And a few months later, I saw Abel Prieto and uh, the Minister of Culture. And he told me, you know what Fidel told me? He was right. <laughs> so that was a small story but, uh, about the, <coughs> the type of, uh, um, of um, 
discussion. And that was very interesting because, of course, uh, like I said, the, the Cubans don't, don't dare to say anything which could contradict Fidel. But as a matter of fact, Fidel likes to have a, a possibility of discussion. And I remember at the end of this meeting, I think, uh, Fidel was there to conclude. And I happened to be at the first, uh, first ranch in the, in the room. And Fidel came and he saw me. And he began his speech they sing, saying, I will be brief. <laughs> and he spoke four hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is it. Uh, anyway. So, did you miss your plane? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <laughs> just, just on time. But of course, they they brought me through the through the VIP area, uh, so I could <laughs> go directly to the plane, and I got the plane. Yeah. <laughs> But another time was when uh, the, this uh, meeting on terrorism, uh, that was um, an initiative of Fidel in, on a very short time. So the Cuban invited me and because of my courses at Louvain, I, I, I could not be there the first day. I came the first night. And uh, I was able to assist to the last meeting of, of the day. And I found that there was a, a terrible confusion about the concept. Uh, what is terrorism, finally? So I decided to, I had to speak the following morning in the first session. So I decided to try to reflect on uh, a more, a more theoretical approach to terrorism. What is uh, terrorism? And um, so I, I spent the night to to prepare that for the following morning. And I had traveled the, the whole day before. So, but anyway, the following morning I came to the room, to the meeting room, uh, a little bit ahead of time. And some of my friends told me, well, come, come take a coffee hmm, uh, across the, across the, uh, how do you call that, the place where you speak, you know, really, behind, behind the scene. And so I went there and, and then came Fidel. And so we had coffee together, we began to discuss and he told me, Terrorism is absolutely unacceptable from any side. Maybe from the Palestinians or from the Chechens or from any side, terrorism is absolutely unacceptable. And I can say, I think I can say, he told me, that during the Cuban Revolution, we never killed an innocent, innocent person. Hmm. Uh, that should be a principle. So I was uh, happy to hear that because I had the same position. Uh, even trying to go a little further, uh, saying that uh, the use of terrorist methods is always counterproducing. Hmm. Even from a political point of view, even. And of course, from an ethical point of view. Hmm. Uh, however, later on, I, I used also the, the position of uh, Archbishop Romero from Salvador, who said, uh, yes, violence, we are against violence. But the violence of the oppressing groups in society is something different of the violence of the people resisting. Hmm? You cannot put both on the same level. Hmm? 
Yeah, that is also true. So, so then, uh, well, then I made my, my intervention, but I was, uh, uh, I was happy to have had that conversation with Fidel before, because I knew what was the position of Fidel. And later on, we worked in a small group with Fidel also to make the conclusion of this uh, meeting. And then we developed the whole idea of uh, state terrorism, because there was uh, a definition of the United Nations about terrorism, but they avoid to speak about state terrorism, because the United Nations is the, 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 the organism of the states, so they will not uh, condemn themselves <laughs> ahead of time. So we add the notion of state terrorism. Hmm? In the, in, the, in, the, in the final paper, or in the final year. So that, that, that is a kind of, uh, of contact, yeah. Uh, the first time I met uh, Chavez was in, um, in El Salvador at the meeting of um, the Sao Paulo uh, forum. The Sao Paulo Forum is an initiative of uh, Lula uh, for uh, generally a, a yearly meeting of the leftist parties of Latin America. And they, they meet uh, in different places of Latin America. As a matter of fact, in this year, in 2016, they met again in Salvador. So I went there uh, uh, just uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, but at that time, it was uh, also a meeting in El Salvador of the F Sao Paulo Forum. And uh, Chavez was just coming out of jail. He was not known. I mean, even among the leftist parties in Latin America, he was not seen uh, with great confidence, because he was more considered as a military who had made a putsch which failed, had been in jail, and just uh, after two or three years uh, coming out of jail. And so some people perhaps have no, had known him, but very little people, a little number of people had known him. And the image was more negative than positive. And so I remember an incident uh, because Chavez wanted to speak to the audience. But uh, for a reason or another, I don't know why, his name was not on the list of speakers that uh, Shafiq Handal was one of the commandant of the um, of the Faramundo uh, Marti Liberation Front of El Salvador, who uh, just the peace agreement had been signed in El Salvador, so they could act uh, publicly. And he was presiding the, the forum, and he had made, of course, the list of speakers, and Chavez was not on the list. Or Shafiq Handal was a member of the Communist Party of, um, of El Salvador and one of the greatest leaders of the popular uh, revolt in, in El Salvador and later on became the chairman of the parliament. And so uh, Shafiq, uh, when, uh, when Chavez asked for the war, <laughs> for the floor, uh, Shafiq Andal said, but you are not on the list. So, of course, Chavez became extremely angry. He made a whole, whole incident because he was refused to, to, uh, to, take, to take the floor. Hmm? But Chavez was extremely strict and said, no. <laughs> so, uh, that was... Uh, a very strong incident, especially between the two personalities. 
And I remember a few years later, in 2004, if I remember, I was invited uh, in uh, Brasilia for the inauguration of Lula. Hmm? And at night, there was a reception in the presidential palace. And when I came in, what did I see? Chavez and Shafiq Handal speaking together. So, of course, I went immediately and I said hello to both of them. And I said, you remember a few years ago in San Salvador? <laughs> so they began to laugh, of course, to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> that was the, that was the <coughs> their first meeting also, you know. Um, so of course, the, the times had changed. So at the beginning, the the image of Chavez was not uh, in the left, was not uh, necessarily um, a positive image. Of course, later on, when Chavez was better known. Uh, they discovered that Chavez was not only a military first, he had also a training in political sciences, and uh, he had read many things. And what amazed me that he, he was able to continue to read during his uh, presidency. I don't know how he was making that, but anyway, um, many of his speeches he was bringing about books you know, and, and, and reading and making reference to some parts of the, the books he had read. And so it was a learned person. But also he had some very specific uh, social vision. True enough, he was a nationalist. He was a Latin Americanist <laughs> in the line of Simon Bolivar. He knew Simon Bolivar very, very, very well. Hmm? Uh, I could, we could say, I think that he, he was a specialist of Simon Bolivar. So when he was quoting Simon Bolivar, it was really with a, a real knowledge of the thinking. Uh, Simon Bolivar was not a socialist revolutionary. He, he was a liberal man of, of his time, but uh, he had strong, uh, strong social positions. He had strong, uh, also, uh, popular positions. Uh, and that was retaken by Chavez to adapt that to the present day circumstances. At the same time, to change the, <coughs> the, the situation of Venezuela, but also to retake and rebuild in a new way the Latin American integration, which was a great idea of Simon Bolivar at the conference of Panama in 1824-25. Uh, and <clears throat> with the idea of the great, the great um, uh, patria, la patria grande, uh, the, the great, um, it is your, your own land, you know, but uh, all Latin America is only one, one nation, you know. So that was, of course, that has been one of the main ideas also of Charles. So uh, several times I've been invited to Venezuela for different kinds of meetings of the red of intellectuals, uh, the World Social Forum, and uh, the, fo the World Forum for Alternatives, that we organized the international meeting there in, in 2008, yeah. Uh, so many times I, I was able to, uh, to assist. And some, some of the times I was invited by, <coughs> by Chavez uh, to attend smaller meetings or a dinner with him and, and, and a few other people. So 
little by little I began to know him a little more personally. And then uh, he invited me to some uh, meetings or twice he invited me to his program on Hello Presidente. Hmm? Uh, his weekly program generally on Sunday uh, where he speaks with the people. Hmm? Uh, contrary to what is the case in, in Ecuador, it is not the only discourse of the president to explain what he has done, but it is more a dialogue. Hmm? He asks the people to speak. Hmm? He speaks, of course. But oh, he, he speaks, he, he sings, <laughs> he recites poetry, uh, <laughs> it is a, a mixture uh, of, of many things, uh, very interesting, it, it was very interesting. But of course it was, during, it was during hours and hours, but a good part of the program of Hello Presidente was to let the people speak, you know, about their situation, about uh, what they were thinking, etc. <coughs> so twice he invited me to to be there and ask me to speak about religious issues. So the uh, first time uh, it was about the uh, use of religion in politics. And of course, uh, Chavez is, was a religious person, a believer. Uh, I would say he was uh, a Christian believer, uh, almost in the way of the popular religion. Hmm? Uh, not very elaborated from a theological point of view, but uh, very much uh, lived as a personal thing also. And sometimes he, he had always a small cross in his pocket. And sometimes he was taking the cross and saying, Jesus Christ is for me a reference. Hmm? Because he was one of the first socialists. <laughs> because he, had, he, he, he was fighting for justice, etc., etc. Okay. So of course people were accusing uh, Chavez to use religion for political reasons. You know. So at one, at once, I remember we had gone to the the place where the Hello Presidente was taking place at that time. It was uh, across the mountains from Caracas uh, to the sea. So we took an helicopter to go there and. Uh, I began to speak about the use of religion for political purposes. And I said, of course, in Latin America, we have a long tradition of using religion to back uh, political issues. But when we see what is the position of Hugo Chavez, that is not the same. It is not using religion to to uh, to back, uh, to have a legitimation for a certain type of political regime? No. It is just to recognize that uh, Jesus uh, has fought for justice, and then if we believe in him, uh, we have to do the same. <laughs> and, and that is what he is expressing. You know? expressing in a very sincere way without trying to get uh, the legitimation of the hierarchical church uh, for the political regime. So it is quite different. Hmm? The use of religion for political purposes or to recognize that in religious faith uh, you have a social dimension and that to be faithful to your religious belief, you have also to be committed for uh, social goals. So that's what I try to explain during this. Uh, 
And so Travis was, was listening, listening, and he said, but Francois, why don't you stay six months with, our, with us? <laughs> <laughs> so each time that I was uh, seeing him, uh, seeing him in meetings, etc., he was saying, "Francois, your blessing." And he said, "I need your blessing." <laughs> so that was very spontaneous from him, you know. And I remember I was very impressed by that. The last time I saw him, it was a few months before uh, his death. It was a meeting of the a meeting of the São Paulo Forum in Caracas, and I was uh, with a group of people um, on the stair, uh, a big stair, in the main the main uh, hall uh, of the cultural center of Caracas, and then he came. But he was a little uh, far, f further away, so I called him. I said, Presidente. And then he, he, he saw me, and then he made only one thing. He put his two hands like that, and he said, uh, practically it was, pray for me, you know. Of course, he, he knew that he was uh, sick. I We didn't know. Hmm? And he spoke, he spoke during few hours, you know, uh, being, uh, being, uh, not sitting, you know. Uh, and, and he was already, he had been in Cuba for cure, and came back, etc. So it was already at the moment he, 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 he was surely knowing that his uh, situation was a serious condition, you know. So I remember that, of course, because uh, so I was uh, I was not astonished because when 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 we met, he was always saying, uh, "I ask your blessing," you know. But um, but of course, I was impressed by the gesture that he made, and it is of course later on that I could understand what was the real meaning of it. You know?